Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Jenny Williamson, and I am the Massachusetts State Director at the Education Trust. And I'm delighted to be here with you all today. It looks like we have a really great turnout. And I'm also excited to see so many familiar names on the call. I'm even more excited actually to dive in and share some of the new data we've collected with our partners, the Massing Polling Group, that highlights parents' perspectives on college and career readiness. But quickly, a little bit about the Education Trust. We are a data and research-driven organization committed to advancing policies and practices that dismantle racial and economic barriers embedded in the education system and really building a more equitable system where every child has the opportunity to thrive. But most importantly, we do this work in partnership with community leaders, educators, students, and families, especially those from historically underserved communities to really ensure that their perspectives and experiences are front and center when important policy decisions are being made. And in that spirit of uplifting community voice, we collaborated with the Massing Polling Group this fall to conduct a statewide poll of parents of children in grades six through 12. And the poll asked parents a variety of questions on a variety of different topics from post high school planning to college and career readiness, vocational programming and more. Uh, and this yielded some really, really interesting results, which we are so excited to share with you today. This was the ninth in a series of polls that we have done with Mass Inc. and has been made possible thanks to the support of the Barr Foundation. And I also want to acknowledge and express our gratitude to our partners on the Massachusetts Education Equity Partnership, many of whom I see on the call here today, uh, who really played a key role in helping shape the content of this poll. Now, a couple of quick logistical notes before we get started. If you have questions throughout the event, feel free to submit them via the Q&A function. We have carved out time at the end to address questions, so we'll be sure to get to them then. Um, in addition, we will be recording this presentation and we'll be posting a recording of the webinar along with the slides on both the EdTrust and Mass Inc. websites. Now, I'm sure you're all anxious for us to dive in, but before we do, let me first share a quick overview of what you should expect from our time here today. So here is a glimpse of the agenda. We are excited to kick things off with remarks from Commissioner Noe Ortega, who will share a statewide perspective on some of the issues highlighted in the poll. Next, we will dive into the poll findings with a presentation from Steve Cazella, president of the Massing Polling Group. And then afterwards, we're gonna shift our focus onto what's next. That is, what can we be doing as policymakers, practitioners, advocates to ensure that all students and their families have access to the information and support they need to succeed after high school. Now that's all done. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce our first guest speaker, Massachusetts Commissioner of Higher Education, Dr. Noe Ortega. Before serving as the Higher Ed Commissioner here in Massachusetts, Dr. Ortega served in several roles in the Pennsylvania Department of Education, most recently as Secretary of Education. Prior to joining the Pennsylvania Department of Education, he spent eight years at the University of Michigan, where he held several academic and administrative roles and published research focused on post-secondary access and success for underserved communities. He has served in several leadership roles across government and academia, and we are extremely lucky to have him leading our higher education work here in Massachusetts. So with that, I will now turn it over to the commissioner to offer some welcoming remarks. Commissioner Ortega, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jenny, and welcome everyone to today's event. I am so pleased to be here and so pleased at the invitation, invitation to spend some time with you today. Like many of you in attendance, the department shares in your commitment to closing the education, uh, education opportunity and attaining gaps here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It is work that's critical. And I think we're at a critical moment here in Massachusetts to carry out this mission and help a number of students. There's a number of new entrants into this policy space, including myself, who's been in this role for a year, but we also have a new administration, changing legal context, political context, all the things that require for us to really double down on our commitment to ensuring equity and access for all students. This is also a time to do this collaboratively with our joint efforts 
and uh, uh, and build on some of the things that I think have been historic in terms of investments in our institutions of higher education, particularly the public institutions in the past year. And I'm truly grateful to the Haley Driscoll administration, as well as members of the legislature and other advocates who have made this happen. I wanna take a moment today in my introductory remarks to highlight a few of the things that have happened in the past several months. We've rolled out a community college program called Mass Reconnect that provides opportunities for those students who are 25 years and older and wanna reconnect to get back on a pathway to post-secondary attainment to come back to our community colleges and do this at zero cost for tuition and fees and receive some out-of-pocket expenses as they relate to books and supplies as well. And this is a phenomenal program that allows a number of our, what I would call the new traditional students at our colleges and universities to re-engage with higher ed learning and get back on a pathway. But we didn't stop there. We were also able to receive additional expansion dollars to improve our Mass Grant Plus program and now allow for all students who are Pell eligible in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to attend any of our public institutions also at zero cost for tuition and fees, including some funds for uh, uh, books and supplies. This is a phenomenal extension to the programs that we're already providing opportunities to a number of students. And now we've got this sort of new affordability framework in Massachusetts that really provides uh, resources to students who need it the most. And I think as you think about the survey and its findings, there was a lot of calls around affordability and making sure that people both had the resources, but also were directed to where these resources could be secured and how to secure them as well. We've done something incredible in Massachusetts as well in the past couple of months is we've made the provision of our uh, grants and in-state tuition available to undocumented families with tuition equity as well. We stand among those states that do this both in terms of in-state tuition, but also making the undocumented students eligible for all our financial aid programs, which is incredible. And so many of these same programs that I called down in terms of Mass Reconnect, uh, as well as the Mass Grant Plus dollars are now available to them and can help them go to college and university here in Massachusetts at zero cost for tuition and fees, which is phenomenal. All these investments have allowed us to really move Massachusetts to the top and the leader of the pack in terms of investments in financial aid. We went from a year ago being 26 amongst the nation in terms of states investing in need-based aid or financial aid in general to number 12th in the country in terms of financial aid. And we've done this in the last six months. We've made it our goal here at the department and we continue to uh, say this in every space we go into that we need to be the top, the leader in terms of how we invest. The one thing that makes us unique as well is that we've been able to do this in terms of elevating need-based aid to our students. If you look at the list of those states that stand before us, many of them have invested a large number of their funds in merit-based aid programs. Massachusetts has done it differently. They've prioritized equity and access and made sure that our investments were targeted at those who need the resources the most. None of this would have been made possible in terms of uh, investments in higher education without the passage of the Fair Share Amendment. And I know that amongst all those here in attendance, I would be remiss if I didn't call out the work that was done by the Massachusetts Teachers Association under the leadership of Max Page to advocate for this. And I know they had a number of folks here on this call advocate for this importance. And these dollars remain there to be invested in education at large, both in the early ed, secondary, K-12 spaces, but also higher ed as well. And I think this is really putting out a framework or a value statement of making sure that all students have the knowledge, the tools, and the resiliency to persevere and move into post-secondary opportunities. So it just goes to show that together we can accomplish a whole lot. And I hope in the discussions that you have today, uh, throughout the day, we elevate the importance of collaborating. As you look at the results from the poll that's gonna be talked about today, it's clear that we have a lot more to do and accomplish in this space. And in short, we need to work harder to make sure that we undo some of the um, conceptions that exist out there in terms of keeping people out of pursuing a post-secondary uh, pathway, right? Some of these examples are an overestimation of academic readiness for post-secondary education, right? Also an overestimation of the cost. I'll be clear, it does not cost $70,000 a year to go to any college 
for university, right? And in fact, the more that we do as a state, it becomes affordable for more and more folks as well. Underestimating the availability of financial aid is also a big problem, which for us at the department means it's a call to action to be better about finding ways to make sure that we put the message out there of what's available, but do it in a way that's understood by our students and families and in places where they can encounter this message, right? It's not enough to just say we have a state level strategy that goes out there and puts billboards in different parts of uh, Massachusetts, but we've got to do more about getting this information directly into the hands of folks like yourself and making sure that there's an understanding of what is available and how to be able to get these funds for our students to make college truly affordable. I am hoping that our investments that we've been making this year are getting closer to cutting through some of these misconceptions and to send the message to everyone that yes, you can go to college. And then if you come from a working class family and feel that there's not a lot of resources, we're undoing that misconception by saying, yeah, we're moving our provision of financial aid for families all the way up to $100,000 to make sure that they too know they can truly afford college in Massachusetts as well. As well. I wanna be very clear as a department, we've done this by making sure that we emphasize putting out there a definition of truly affordable, understanding that costs for our students and families go beyond tuition and fees and have to do with a number of other things, right? That are not just books and supplies, but thinking more intentionally about how we can address some of the insecurities that maybe a number of folks uh, face around housing, food in some cases, childcare, the list goes on and on. And I know a number of you have advocated to make sure that this is known, that the cost of college is more and in many ways, in order to get more people to make a commitment to go to post-secondary education, we've got to do better about understanding the full picture of what they encounter when they make this choice. We're in a position now to think about what happens next. And if I can leave the group here with anything is join us in our advocacy to make sure that we let people know that we've got to continue to do more. Creating uh, tuition-free opportunities for those who are eligible is a great first step. We must do more and drill down even further to make sure we can address other costs and expenses that those who truly need an investment to help them take this next step can do so and that our financial aid programs align there. We did something for our middle uh, income families this year making less than $100,000 and are not Pell eligible but we were only able to get them halfway with regards to our investments in tuition and fees. We need to take the next step in making sure that they too can have truly affordable and making sure that we can cover their tuition and fees as well. So we ask that you join us in advocating for more um, to be done in that space as well. And we can't stop there. You know, we've got conversations at the moment talking about making college debt free, talking about making our community college free as well. And so we wanna make sure that we continue to put hands on the students who need the most help, but we move towards a definition of true affordability in Massachusetts that incorporates all of these aspects, right? And the department is working really hard to uh, invite more people into a discussion about how we can get there and how we can get there soon. I hope we discuss this and a number of other things throughout the day. And I hope today's discussions raise questions about how we could be better in advocating for opportunity and success for all our learners here in Massachusetts as well. Our North Star remains and should be promoting, promoting quality K-12 and post-secondary degree programs here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's our guiding goal at the Department of Higher Education, and I know it's yours as well. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you to the all group here for inviting me and indulging me with an invitation to provide opening remarks. I look forward to the discussions that transpire today. With that, I hand the virtual back, the mic back to you and let's get this conversation started. Great. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for your powerful words and reflections. It's been really so exciting to see all the incredible progress that has been made to increase access and affordability to higher ed across the state um, in recent months. But as you said, we do have a lot more work to do and accomplish in this space. And so we all stand ready to advocate on this issue and, and look forward to continuing to work with you and the administration to really support your vision for a more equitable and bright post-secondary future for all Massachusetts students. So on behalf of the Education Trust and the Mass Polling Group, we are 
so grateful you took the time to join us here today and we remain grateful for your tremendous leadership on these issues, so thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Steve Cazella, president of the Mass Inc. Polling Group, who will share some findings from our statewide survey. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Jenny, uh, and thank you for the introduction of the poll results that you provided earlier. <clears throat> Um, I, that by way of preamble, would say that we're going to take a very quick spin through these results, um, but to remind folks of something that Jenny mentioned earlier, these will be posted on both the Massing Polling Group and the EdTrust website after the event, so you can go through and take a more leisurely stroll through some of this data. There's also uh, top lines and cross tabs with other results and just a lot of uh, interesting demographic breakdowns on all of these questions. So, um, Zaina, if you could go forward to the next slide. Uh, this slide has just a, a little bit about the survey that we're going to be looking at today and, and what it represents and where it sits in the long trajectory of the surveys that we've been doing together with Ed Trust and the Barr Foundation going all the way back to 2020. This survey is a survey of just over a thousand parents of grades of uh, Massachusetts school children in grades six to 12. As with all the surveys in this series, it includes oversamples of Black, Latino, and Asian parents to let us break down results a bit more finely than we would be able to do if we just did a simple representative survey of parents statewide. And you'll see the benefits of that very clearly, I think, as we walk through the, through the survey results, just in terms of the detail that we're able to provide. As I mentioned, this is this is in a series of surveys that goes it goes back a couple of years now, most of which were K-12 parents. This one, again, is grade 6 to 12 parents. Um, in terms of dates, this was done a little bit earlier on in the school year, so sort of mid-September to early October, and we worked together with Education Trust with support from the Bar Foundation on the survey. So we're actually going to skip over the key findings at the moment, just in the interest of time and because we're actually going to be digging, going right into the details. Um, but again, if you want to look at them, they'll be both on our website and on the EdTrust website for you to, to take a glance at. So what are we, <clears throat> so the first question that we see here is the question of, of who has influence or who parents think has influence in terms of helping uh, their school-aged children make plans for the future. So um, the first, uh, the, the numbers that you're looking at on this, on this slide are the percent who said that they think each of these groups is a quote, very important influence on their, on their uh, children's plans. You can see that not surprisingly, we're talking to parents, par uh, parents are most likely to see themselves as being a very important influence with just about 80%. Um, which is the number in the first column there saying that they would call themselves a very important influence. Looking, sticking in that first column for a minute, that's that first column represents all parents that were included in the survey. You can see that after the 79% who called themselves or parents a very important influence, there's a bit of a drop off down to teachers at 61%, 58% for family members and so forth and so on. Then when you kind of read across the chart, you see something pretty interesting, which is that there's a lot of agreement in terms of the importance of parental influence. But then when you look down the chart a bit more, there, more parents of color see a broader range of influences as being very important. So for instance, 55% of white parents uh, call both teachers and other family members very important influences. But then when you look at black parents, Latino parents and Asian parents, in each case, those percent, percentages are actually a bit higher. And that pattern repeats itself as you continue down the chart um, for guidance counselors, college prep programs, and also friends and peers plans. So a broader range of influences are called very important um, by parents of color compared to white parents. Go ahead, Zaina. Okay, so then the next question is basic is asking, okay, you are a very important influence. How much discussion have you had at this point? And you can see here that 75% uh, overall, that top set of bars say they've had at least a great deal or a fair amount of discussion. Um, fewer say a little or not at all. Um, <clears throat> but black parents are the most likely to say that they've had either a great deal or a fair amount of, of discussion as far as what their, ch their children's hopes and plans are for after high school. Um, you actually, this actually also increases for parents of children that are in high school and sort of the later grades of high school compared to um, parents who are, who have middle school children. Go ahead, Sam. 
what so then the, this next slide shows what the plans actually are so the last one was have you talked about them have you talked to your children about what their plans might be this slide shows what parents think their children might be interested in doing once they finish high school so the most common response 57 percent, is begin a bachelor's degree then we see uh, the rest of the responses are spread out between a training program for a trade job, an associate degree, entering the workforce or something else. Um, this one actually adds up to a bit more than 100% just because you could select more than one thing and, and a number of parents did select more than one thing. Go ahead. So this slide shows one of the open-ended responses we received from the from the survey. Uh, these are uh, in, there's a lot more detail on these again in the full um, full poll results that are shown on the website. Just to quickly read for folks who may be just listening in, the quote says, "My child is entering high school below grade level, given a remedial course in ninth grade. That means they can never catch up and take advanced courses. Once at a disadvantage, always at a disadvantage." Go ahead, Zena. So you, you might remember uh, two slides ago, we saw 57% said that they thought that their children would be potentially interested in starting a bachelor's degree. You see that number repeated here at the top of this slide. Um, but then what this one does is it breaks down the percent who said that they think their child would be interested in starting a bachelor's degree to, uh, to a number of demographic groups. And you see just kind of glancing down the groupings that are shown on this chart that there are very clear patterns. So for instance, looking at the first set of bars there, among parents who live in households with incomes of $100,000 or more, 77% said that they thought their child would be interested in a bachelor's degree. And then you see that that goes down to 49% at the next income level, 42 and then in 42%. And then in households with incomes under $50,000, we're down to 26% who said they thought their child would be interested in a bachelor's degree. Looking also at the educational breakdown of the parents who responded to the survey, what you see basically is parents who went to college and completed a, at least a four-year or advanced degree, um, <clears throat> the perception that their children were also interested in a bachelor's degree was much, much higher than parents who either had some college education or high school or less. So for instance, among parents who themselves had an advanced degree, 89% said that they thought their child would be interested in starting a bachelor's degree. And then among those with, with um, high school or less themselves, that number is down to 29%. So a 60 point gap there, um, just based on educational level of the parent themselves. And then the bottom set of bars you see, um, Asian and white parents are more likely than, particularly than Latino parents to say that they thought their child would want to start a bachelor's degree. Go ahead. This next slide then shows a bit more detail on the same question. So the question of what you think your child might like to do. And the thing that really stands out here, um, and we bolded the numbers just to kind of draw your attention to them, is that particularly Latino parents were more likely to say they think their child would like to begin a training program for a trade job or to begin, begin an associate degree compared to, compared to the rest of the parents in the survey. Go ahead. So of course, you know, the college process, college application process, college financial aid process are very complicated and um, it, it perceived to be very complicated by parents. And the question that we asked was basically, how much do you think you know about both the admissions process and the financial aid process? And what this chart shows is the percent who said they think they know either a great deal or a fair amount about the college admissions process. And overall, looking at the number on the far left-hand side of the chart, you can see that it's about two-thirds who think that they know at least a fair amount about the application process. Um, but then similar to the, the chart we looked at a couple of slides ago, there are big, big differences in terms of the educate by uh, the education level of the parent and then the household income level. So for instance, parents with advanced degrees themselves um, Ninety percent think they know at least a fair amount uh, about the college admissions process, compared to forty percent, just under forty percent, actually, among parents who have high school or less themselves. You see similar differences by income, uh, by income with upper income parents or parents living in upper income households, um, saying that they know much more about the admissions process. 
I mean, then fi the final number that stands out in this chart is the percent of Latino parents who say that who say that they know a great deal or a fair amount, which is which is a bit lower than the rest of the parents in the survey. Go ahead. This same basic pattern shows up in the in uh, perceived knowledge of the financial aid process, where um, you've got about about 56% uh, overall who, who say that they know at least a fair amount about the financial aid process. Um, but then once again, parents who, who have at least a bachelor's or an advanced degree think they know much more about the financial aid process and um, parents who live in upper income households also think they know more. Whereas parents who um, are living in households with total income under 50,000, just 36% think they know even a fair amount about the process. Um, so a simpler way of saying it would be parents to whom this would be the most important and the most impactful are also the least likely to say that they know at least a fair amount about the process. Go ahead, Zainab. So continuing with the theme of just of kind of knowledge of, uh, of uh, some of the important elements about high school and, and going on from high school, uh, what this question was is basically the perception of whether or not your child's school offers these each, each of these kinds of programs. And this was asked, asked only of high school parents. Um, and what you can see starting at the top is looking at AP classes or international baccalaureate programs. Um, you see that overall 55% of high school parents think that yes, their child's school offers them. But uh, looking at the next four columns, which again is parental income, or I'm sorry, education level, you see that there's a very, very large difference in terms of the percent of parents who think that these courses are being offered at their child's school, um, starting with 28% among um, high school parents, all the way up to 79% of those who, I'm sorry, parents with high school, a high school uh, level of education compared to 79% of um, parents with advanced degrees. Similar kinds of differences uh, in terms of uh, income level with, with uh, much higher perceived, with much more common perceptions that AP classes are being offered um, among upper income parents. Also looking down at the bottom of this chart, you see that, that the numbers who say that they don't know uh, kind of show the opposite pattern where, it, where you see much more, many more parents saying that they just don't know the answer as far as whether any of these programs are being offered in their child's high school, or in their, yes, in their child's high school. One other interesting note on this is on, on early college, which does not show the same pattern, but actually, uh, um, which doesn't show the same pattern either by income or parental education level or race, uh, much more evenly distributed knowledge on, on early college programs. Um, Zane, if you could actually go two slides ahead, just because we're, we're, we just want to touch on a couple more slides here uh, before we turn it over to the panel. Um, what this one is, is basically concerns about the cost of college. And um, <clears throat> the question was, when thinking about the possibility of your child attending college, how much of a concern is each of the following? We can see, not surprisingly, tuition, room, and board are by far the highest and of common concern um, across all the demographic groups shown on this slide. Whereas the ones that get discussed perhaps a bit less often uh, are of greater concern, both to parents of color and to uh, lower income or parents who live in lower income households, where uh, you see you know pretty big gaps in terms of the um, in terms of the concern level about the cost of books and also just the cost of applications themselves. Go ahead to the next slide. So we also included a fair amount about Vogue Tech in the survey, and um, what we've what we found was that a majority think that uh, Vogue Tech programs are not being offered at their child's school at the moment. Just 29% say that they are being offered. Um, but what this other pie chart here on the right shows is, okay, among those who say that they're not being offered or they don't know, um, how many think that they would benefit their child if they were offered? And there we see that it's actually a pretty good majority. 63% say that, they, that if the programs were being offered, that they would be a benefit to their own their own children. Go to the next slide. 
And um, when you break that 63% out, you can see that there are some, uh, there are some patterns in terms of the, dem the demographics of, of the people who are most likely to say that it would be a benefit to, to their children, uh, with 75% of Latino parents saying that, that these programs would be a benefit, and about two-thirds of Black parents. And then you can also see a, a breakdown of parental by parental education level in the, um, in the chart down there at the bottom. Um, and, uh, okay, so we're, we're at 1030, so I'm going to just look at Jenny and see, do, should we touch on any of the, any of these final slides or uh, turn it over to the panel? No, I think we can um, move on. As, as I said, we, we've got all of these slides and data on our website, so feel free to peruse some more. Um, but thank you so much, Steve. Clearly, there's a lot to unpack from the data. Uh, but for me, I think the data really highlights a need to do more to ensure that families, especially Latinx and low-income families, really have access to the information, resources, and navigational supports needed to really help their child make informed decisions about what comes after high school. Which leads to our next segment. <clears throat> Where do we go from here? I'd like to introduce my amazing colleague, Shanti Lopes, who is the Assistant Director for Engagement and Communications for the Education Trust Massachusetts. And Shanti will be leading a panel to address this question and more. Shanti, over to you. Thank you, Jenny, and good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to now welcome our panelists onto the screen, who we are so grateful to have with us this morning. Uh, they will share a little bit about their experience while also reflecting on some of the poll findings, which you just heard from Steve. I'm going to give each of you a chance to introduce yourself, going to start with Erica, Liz, Beth, and ending with Femi, if you could just share your name, your role, and anything that you would like the audience today to know about you. Uh, Erica, kick it off with you. Thanks so much. My name is Erica GM Pietro, and I am the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Alliance for Early College, and really looking forward to this discussion. Hi, my name is Lisbeth Teneo, and I'm currently a college student at Barnard College, and I'm very excited for this discussion as well. Good morning, folks. My name is Femi Stoltz, and I am the Massachusetts Policy Director at US Fire. Also looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Uh, again, we are so grateful to have you all here today. Uh, your perspective and experiences as community uh, and policy leaders, and of course, as a student, is uh, not only insightful, but also necessary in these uh, sorts of conversations. Um, but now, I, that's enough for me. I uh, want to jump right into the discussion um, and just want to remind the audience that we will have um, an opportunity for uh, Q&A a little later on. So if you have questions uh, throughout the panel, uh, feel free to drop it in the Q&A. So going to start off with the first question, and um, this is sort of for everyone uh, to jump right in. So ab after having heard the poll findings um, regarding parents' uh, expectations when it comes to uh, some post uh, high school plans, as well as when it comes to advanced course opportunities, uh, which, as you saw, uh, included pursuing a degree, a training program, or more. Just curious, after hearing, um, again, some of the findings, what was your initial reaction to the data that you heard today? And again, feel free to, to jump in. Thanks so much. Um, I'll just say, you know, I think that the the poll really documents what we're seeing qualitatively among students and families, and it's really helpful for it to be distilled so clearly. You know, parents overwhelmingly want their children to have the option to attain a college degree, um, but we see that the cost and, and the complexity of doing so is a real barrier. We know in Massachusetts that only 20% of our Black and Latino students and students from low-income homes are getting that degree today. So there's a big difference between aspirations and reality. It's breaking along lines of race and income, and it matters greatly on both the individual level and also for the well-being of our community as a whole. Uh, the good news and why I feel so compelled to be doing this work at this moment is that this gap is not set in stone. A lot of these problems have solutions that, if implemented well, can really make a difference, and I'm looking forward to discussing some of those today. 
Uh, thank you so much. Oh, Femi, I see you came off mute. And then I'll, uh, looks like Lizbeth also has something to add. Oh, I'll be really quick. I will just say with regards to college degrees specifically, I think the data highlights that parents who have gone to college, or more specifically, those groups who have historically gone to college still are. And I think that knowledge or perception of kind of who goes to college is reflected in parents' perception on college degrees as an option for their children. And I don't wanna to get too ahead of myself in the combo, but I do think that we have a responsibility to change that reflection and change that perception. Thank you, Elizabeth. I completely agree with what both of you guys are saying. I, my initial reaction was for sure surprised in how many parents think that like their um, student, that their child's high school is preparing them as like, I've gotten into the education field. I know that that's not necessarily the high schools are trying their best, but there's a lot of gaps, as Erica mentioned. But then as I looked at the data more and I started to think as well, um, at least for the parents that I've been around and like being in a low income and minority environment, a lot of parents think that they're that their child's high school is preparing them because compared to what they had when they were, for example, like in another country or when they were younger, it is better. So in comparison, it is better, but it's, but it's not like totally what we wanted. So again, it just shows that we still have room to grow, but it also shows that there is some growth. Thank you all for sharing uh, your initial thoughts. I'm actually going to jump in um, on Femi's comments. Um, so that was uh, one of the things that stood up to us, uh, which Femi also mentioned, was the correlation between um, the path that parents pursued per post high school um, and what they thought they wanted their child to do. Uh, just to be a little bit more clear, uh, parents who were degree holders were a lot more likely to say that they also thought their child would prefer uh, a degree. Uh, so just wanted to, and again, Femi already started this, so just wondering if you had anything else to add, or of course, Erica or Lizbeth, uh, recognizing that kids can take different paths. How can, what can we do to really uh, level the playing field so that kids have the same opportunities, uh, access to resources and supports? Sure, I can hop back in. Uh, I think we can do a lot better to inform families about career paths post-graduation. And it'll become clear through the conversation that I'm like a huge, huge supporter of post-secondary education. But I also understand that that is not and cannot be the only path for students after high school. And I think students got this really false narrative for a long time that like you either need to go to college or your life will be in turmoil, which we know is just not factual. Um, there are plenty of options for students to pursue after college. And so, I mean, after high school, and so I think it's really important to have those conversations sooner than later. And I think focusing on equitable funding for schools so that these that students have the guidance that they need to explore these different careers, to have these discussions about trades and apprenticeships alongside conversations about college so that students know that they have choices. And then likewise, I just also want to highlight that it's really important to get the information out there because there can exist all the resources in the world, but if students, if the, the people who would benefit the most from those resources don't know that they exist, it, it feels like they're not there to those people. And so we have to do really well to make sure that this information winds up with the, the stakeholders and the folks who really need it. Uh, thank you, and I, and I think we heard that as well, not only in the, in the poll findings, but as well in the focus groups that we have with parents, uh, the importance of starting these conversations um, early on and also ensuring that the information, the critical information is, is given to the people that may need it the most. I uh, just want to give an opportunity, uh, don't feel any pressure, uh, Erica or Lizbeth, anything you wanted to add? I agree with everything that Femi said. I might just add that, you know, I think what we hear loud and clear from students is that they want to be engaged. They want to know how what they're doing in high school is connecting to their larger life goals. And we can do this uh, through many of the different pathway options that exist in Massachusetts. We can also just do it with how we, you know, provide a high school education. That, that engagement, that relevance, I think is increasingly important. Thank you. Couldn't agree with you more. Lizbeth, I saw you came off mute. Yeah, um, 
thinking about this question personally, like as a student that has just, well, not just finished high school, because it's been, I think it's been like three years now that I'm a junior in college. So um, counts as just. <laughs> yes, actually, yeah, I was about to say that I feel a little bit old, but I guess not. Um, I was just thinking the the main thing that really helped me kind of connect high school and college like Erica was saying um is was my early college program which I know is a pathway that you can take and a lot of high school um a lot of high schools my early college program really helped me connect that like high school to college and it made a huge difference so it just shows how like different resources like it doesn't even have to be early college but just different resources um can really tell a student what they want to do or where they want to go or what pathway they want to take Thank you so much. As uh, someone that also participated in, in similar programs way before you did, um, um, I can also attest to, to how those uh, programs can make a huge difference. Um, thank you all for sharing. Now I'm actually going to transition over to a question for Femi. Um, so Femi at you Aspire, your work focuses on advancing policies that make financial aid more accessible, especially for families that need it most. Um, as we heard from the, the survey, uh, parents who are lower income and Latinx parents were less familiar with the financial aid process. So I'm just curious, how is your organization um, helping to bridge that knowledge gap? For sure. So at U Aspire, our programs very specifically focus on low income, first generation and students of color, because we are well aware that these are the populations of students that are the least likely to have information about financial aid processes. But also we understand that these are also the groups that are the most likely to benefit from taking advantage of existing financial aid programs. So those students that we aim to serve through our advising um, is kind of in hopes that we get them specialized advising to the students who might otherwise not have access to financial aid information. And what I mean by specialized advising is like someone who is experienced with the financial financial aid process, excuse me, who can sit with them and complete the FAFSA, who can sit with them and help them compare financial aid offers, which as we know is wild. So really sitting with those students who might not otherwise have access to this information and making sure that we try to bridge that gap by making sure that the students that we serve do have that information and are able to make the best financial decision with regards to post-secondary education. Thank you, Femi. So you mentioned, um, painted a picture of what you aspire specifically is doing and how you support um, students and families. Just curious, as you know, we have a mix of policymakers and advocates It's today. So just wondering, um, in your opinion, what can be done moving forward to ensure that financial aid is more accessible and equitable across the Commonwealth? I think one thing that can be done uh, to make sure that financial aid information is accessible specifically for that group of students I just mentioned, so low income first gen students of color, I think is to make sure that they have information about financial aid. 12 other states so far have implemented uh, what are being called universal FAFSA policies that require FAFSA completion for graduation, and the reason for this is there is this assumption or this narrative that low-income students just don't want to go to college. And the reality is that they're dealing with very, very valid concerns about the cost of college. And I think it's a huge and critical for a student to know that financial aid exists because there is also kind of this assumption that students don't take advantage of financial aid because they don't want to. And that is just not the case. Students don't know about financial aid until somebody gives them that information. And once given that information, that can tremendously impact whether a student just thinks that post-secondary education is in the cards for them. Because if they think their family just can't afford it and they don't know that grants exist, why would they think that college is an option, right? But if someone says, hey, you can get a Pell Grant, you can get the mass grant, suddenly they're like, wait a minute, there's funding available, maybe college is an option for me. And so I think making sure across the board that all of our students, regardless of their plans after high school have at least an option to get information about their financial aid eligibility is really, really critical. Um, and then I think another thing that can be done is to ensure that the conversation about financial aid continues to expand beyond tuition and fees um, and starts to take into account some other considerations like indirect expenses. Um, because in order for financial aid to actually be accessible and keyword equitable, 
it is going to be really critical to try to think about those things that are barriers to students of color and low income students completing right and we want them to be able to graduate with debt and we want them to be able to persist so thinking about things like room and board transportation to get back and forth to classes um you know child care expenses any of those barriers that these students might come up against that might hinder them from either pursuing or persisting once they get to post-secondary education and i think that those are some things that we could pursue now to make financial aid more accessible and more equitable. Thank you very much for, for uh, giving us that insight, um, Femi. Uh, Erica, now I have a question for you. So at the Massachusetts Alliance for Early College, your work focuses on increasing the number of students with access to quality early college programs. I was wondering if you could speak to how early college programs have changed over the last five years or so. Uh, and how do you envision um, that it will be more beneficial in the future? Um, any insight that you could share would be great. Yeah, you know, looking back, we see a really promising launch in Massachusetts. Over the last five years, early college pathways have grown to 58 high schools and 27 colleges. They serve about 8,000 students today, two thirds of whom are Black and Latino, more than half of whom are from low income households. And most importantly is it's working. So analysis from Mass Inc. shows us that early college is doubling the odds of a student immediately enrolling and then again, persisting in college. And the best part about this is those outcomes are consistent across income levels, across race, and also across income and academic performance levels. As we look ahead, I think the success of the early college um, pathway work is this in this next chapter is gonna hinge on our ability to do two things. Um, the first is to even more fully embrace career connections. There are many good reasons to go to college and I don't take lightly the personal development and the liberal arts learning that can occur. That said, as a system, if college attendance isn't resulting in good family sustaining, dignity providing careers, it isn't delivering for our students, or for our workforce and economy. Uh, career connections are already a part of early college, but there's more that we can do to integrate. We have so much strength in Massachusetts. We have terrific career and tech offerings that we can all be leveraging. We have so many incredible businesses in Massachusetts who wanna step up. We've been really um, you know, compelled and impressed by the support uh, that early college has received from the business community, they wanna do more. So I'd like to see us even more seamlessly blend the best elements of our career uh, preparation into early college. The second uh, is around growth. Given how well this initiative is working and what we're seeing, for instance, in this poll, we have an obligation uh, to ensure more students are benefiting from early college pathways. To, to paint a picture here, just this week, the Department of Higher Education released new data on college enrollment statewide. And we see that since the early college initiative was introduced in 2017, high school students as a share of total college enrollment has grown from 3% to 7%. Said differently, at a time when college enrollments are declining overall, high school students uptake of college courses is growing steadily. It's more than doubled over the last five years. Um, there's 7% of all the course takers now. And to put that in perspective, that same number uh, is approaching 30 or even 40% in several other states. We know more students can benefit. We know that as a system, we can rise up to serve them. Um, how will we do it? It's gonna take breadth. So more communities coming in and offering early college. But importantly, it's also going to be uh, about depth. So more students accessing early college in the current communities. And that's going to require investment at the state and local levels. It's going to require enabling conditions statewide on issues like educator capacity, student readiness, and family awareness uh, to ensure we're maintaining high quality as we grow, which is critically important. 
Thank you, uh, Erica, for sharing. I think it's no secret that we've definitely seen a lot of momentum um, and success with early college programs in the last uh, few years in Massachusetts. And uh, uh, appreciate both you, Femi, um, and Erica sharing a little bit about um, what you're doing in your organizations and what can be done um, uh, moving forward as well. But now I'm curious to hear from a, a former Massachusetts student and of course still um, in one of our Massachusetts uh, colleges. Um, so Lizbeth, I'm going to now uh, turn it over to you. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about your own high school experience, uh, what it was like to navigate the post-secondary planning process, um, how did you go about thinking about your post-secondary plans, and what, if any, barriers did you face? Um, that's a great question, and I'll start at like kind of the beginning of the story, um, which was I started thinking about what colleges I wanted to go to junior year at the beginning. It was kind of just like, what do I like about college? Like, is this college something I want to do? Um, and then I started looking at like what colleges I would like, um, just searching them up online and seeing pretty much do I like their website? <laughs> That's all that I knew about. Like, do I like their website? Is it aesthetically pleasing at that point was what I was thinking. Um, and then as time went by, the summer of my junior year I started to think about like what's my story what story do I want to tell to colleges um who am I pretty much because this whole application process is saying who you are but it's hard as a high school student trying to figure out who you are when you don't even know what you want in life so that was a very big process for me as well but when the scene when my senior year came and it was time to apply that's when reality really hit for me that it was like College isn't just like this fun little game, like there's money involved, there's all these applications I need to fill out, there's a bunch of questions I have no answers to, and to top all that off, I did it all online, because that was during COVID, so that made it 10 times harder because usually like with our um our counselors at school they have their office in which I could just like pop in ask a quick question and I'm gone and that was like much easier it was less pressure but now that I was online I had to like make a meeting for every little question even if it was just a question of like hey how do I submit this I had to make a meeting so it kind of just um, it put a very, very big gap. And I know for a lot of my friends as well, it was just kind of like, I'd rather just not do that. Like, I'd rather not just have to set up a meeting. I'd rather just, when there's like a lot of little details that have to go in between, I feel like students, it, it's hard to ask for help because then you have to go through all these loops. And it's at that point, it's like, why do I even want to ask the question? But when I was going through my college um application process the main thing was money like I had to go through the through my college ap application process all by myself um along with many of my friends in which parents don't really feel like they have anything to contribute to the process because a lot of low-income parents or a lot of minority parents never went to college um and if they did it was a while ago so they don't know the system and then on top of that they don't know like the parents that I was around they don't know the language so they're looking at these applications and they're seeing their children um confused but they're just looking at an application they cannot understand so they can't help so you have a student who's navigating this whole process by themselves whose parents know nothing about college and also at the time fully online so they couldn't really reach their school counselors so it was a very hard process to get like my application in to get everything in and at first like my goal was to, like apply to like eight nine colleges like that that's what I thought was correct at the beginning um of my junior year I'm not gonna lie I ended up um applying early to the college that I'm currently currently at and that was the only application I submitted because it was really hard to just get access to all the applications get access to the resources when I was online and also there was nobody around me to really tell me like hey this is the next step of what you need to do when it comes to like parents um the barriers that I faced was for sure again COVID and then money um, my goal was to get into the best college with the most amount of money I can 
get. So it was going to come down to not the college that I mostly liked. It was going to come down to what college gave me the most amount of money. And that was all that matters because at the end of the day, it was me that's going to end up paying for that college, um, not my parents and not anybody around me. So that for sure was the biggest barrier. Did that answer all the points of your questions? Yes, of course. Um, no, thank you so much for being candid. And I think uh, your experience very much aligns with what we heard in, in the poll, right? The complexity when it comes to navigating the college admissions process, uh, completing the financial aid. And then I think another point that we also heard from a lot of parents and families that the concern about the cost of not only attending uh, college, but also all the other factors that Femi mentioned, it's, you know, ensuring that students have, uh, whether that be meals or whether that be money for gas or for parking, if they're, you know, not necessarily living on campus, were all real concerns that we heard about. Um, so thank you for, from a student perspective, also amplifying what we heard um, from parents. Um, I don't know how, but we're at just about uh, to transition. So I'm going to ask one uh, question um, for all of you. Uh, so thinking about the future, what is one thing that you hope uh, policy leaders take away from today's discussion? And again, uh, unfortunately, this is our last question. However, uh, of course, panelists can um, ask questions a little later on, but uh, uh, sorry, the audience, I mean, but just want to make sure that we get to that last question, um, if you all can um, give some insight. You know, we have a strong start here with various pathway offerings in Massachusetts, early college being just one of them. And, you know, we work closely with groups that are doing really terrific work with Voc Tech and Innovation Career Pathways, for example. I'd like to see us commit at the state level to an aspirational vision for where we can take them and really drive an effort to meet it. We know we're heading into a period without the federal funding we've seen. We're gonna have a tighter fiscal situation generally. It's gonna be even more important to be laser focused on results. But let's invest. Yes, financially, uh, especially to get the college funding model right-sized here, but as importantly, let's invest our system's attention and focus in what we know works. Thank you, Erica. Femi Elizabeth. Sure. Yeah, I will chime in really quickly and just say that I hope that policy leaders uh, take away from this discussion that, um, you know, we see and appreciate the commitment that the Commonwealth has made to better serving our students, but we also need to acknowledge that the work is not done. Um, I think the focus does need to shift a little bit to addressing some of the barriers mentioned previously. So again, those indirect expenses, because those, if, if Equity is what we're working for. We have to do better to level the playing field. And I think that one way to level the playing field, um, since our students are not starting at the same point, is to be able to start to address some of those concerns so that our low-income students and our students of color start to have a better experience and see post-secondary education and, and other post-secondary options as, as options for them. Thank you, Femi. Elizabeth? Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's um all about focusing on that gap, mostly for low income um and minority students. So it's a fair it's so it's fair pretty much um focusing on every type of student as well not only the high achieving students the students that make it into like top colleges um but also students who don't want to go to college and want to do something else do like students who want to go into for example my sister is really interested in going to being a dental hygienist so it's like she, for example, doesn't have the resources right now to know, hey, what is my next step to do that? So it's like the, all these different pathways for every single type of student, um, having those resources that allows them to grow. Thank you so much for leaving us with that comment, because I think today's conversation is how do we ensure that we're supporting all students uh, and recognizing that the pathway might look different. Um, so Erica, Lizbeth, and Femi, thank you again for uh, joining us this morning. Um, we will bring you back on screen a little bit later for the audience Q&A. And uh, just a reminder to audience, feel free to continue dropping questions in the chat. But we do have one last presentation today uh, by Steve Osborne, who is a dedicated leader currently serving as a student opportunity officer for the Rhode Island Department of Education. Um, in his role, he is at the forefront of reimagining high school education, 
by spearheading initiatives that have really helped to reshape the educational landscape. So we are really excited to have Steve with us this morning to share more about the approaches they have led, which have really helped to dramatically improve post-secondary post outcomes for students in Rhode Island. Steve, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Shanti, for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for inviting me to share the work that we're doing here in Rhode Island. So we're going to talk about some of the work we've led over the last couple of years to reimagine readiness. And our goal has really been to focus on improving the high school experience for all of our kids. The work started in earnest back in 2017 when Rhode Island launched our Prepare Rhode Island initiative. The, 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 the Prepare Rhode Island plan helped us adopt an employer-led, demand-driven approach to career and technical education. We, we established a statewide approach towards work-based learning. This was an area that a lot of our employers wanted to see more of our kids graduating high school with the skills to be able to be successful in the workplace. And we also saw that there was a lot of work that we needed to do to increase student access to advanced coursework. We developed the Advanced Course Network, which allows students statewide to take courses at our public and private uh, colleges. We also created the Dual Enrollment Fund, which allows our students at no cost, the student, their family, or the school district to take dual enrollment classes. We have a core team that meets on a bi-weekly basis that includes leadership from higher education, the Governor's Workforce Board, and Rhode Island Commerce, which leads our economic development uh, efforts. The theory of change behind this work is that we needed to create a clear and compelling opportunity to get our businesses involved in our schools to be able to make sure they saw a vision and purpose in that. We also needed to make sure that we provide career education opportunities for all of our kids not just kids who are choosing to not go to college after high school, we need to make sure all of our kids learn more about how to get prepared for careers. We also needed to better align our career preparation system so kids graduating from our programs would be prepared to go, be successful in, in careers after high school. And most importantly, we need to make sure we had a sustaining demand amongst students, their parents, and educators for career and technical edu education. When we started this work, we had a disorganized system throughout the state where we had well-intentioned workforce programs, K-12 initiatives, and higher ed initiatives that were attempting to do their best to be able to help support the employers in the state. Through Prepare Rhode Island, we've been able to bring those initiatives together to be able to make sure we're helping provide coordinated, targeted supports to each of our industry areas, whether it be healthcare, whether it be the marine trades or manufacturing, we've helped set up, again, an employer-led, demand-driven process on making sure our programs are helping graduate our kids ready for jobs. Our accomplishments. So since this initiative launched back in 2017, we have increased career, uh, career and technical education programs by 192%. Statewide, right now, we have 278 programs. We've also become a national leader in work-based learning, where we have set up very clear requirements for our kids to get experience and uh, to, to be able to apply their skills in a work-based setting. We have also dramatically increased kids participating in dual enrollment by more than 164% uh, over the last couple of years. The ACN has been able to serve students statewide, where just last year we had more than 8,200 learning experiences. We also changed school accountability. This may seem small, but career readiness indicators are valued just the same as college readiness uh, indicators in Rhode Island. So what's next? Right now, we're working to update that plan. Uh, it should be approved by the Board of Education uh, in the spring. Uh, that'll help us update that plan to make sure we're aligned to the governor's vision for 2030. And we also have had a lot of other statewide initiatives to help expand opportunity. We've had the Real Jobs Rhode Island program, which has helped revolutionize work uh, uh, workforce development programs. We've created the Rhode Island Promise program, which gives students a free associate's degree at the Community College of Rhode Island. And just last year, the Hope Scholarship passed at Rhode Island College, which gives students two, two years of free tuition at Rhode Island College. But as we went through this and developed these great initiatives, and we looked at the data that we we're getting in, which has been overwhelmingly positive, we saw that we needed to do more to make sure all of our kids were prepared for college and career success. In June 2020, we made a presentation to the K-12 Council, which serves as our Board of Education here in Rhode Island. We presented uh, what we had gathered through the Education Opportunity Audit, which is a, a, an initiative that helps review student transcripts, student focus groups, student surveys, parent surveys, and teacher surveys. We presented that to the K-12 Council and it helped uh, kind of, Elizabeth called this out, there's an implied contract between uh, schools, students and parents that when you leave high school, you're going to be ready for what comes next. And what we learned in that is that the reality was that many of our kids were graduating high school unprepared for both college and career success. So we were challenged by the K-12 Council to develop a plan and bring together stakeholders to develop a plan for Rhode Island and how to better prepare our kids. 
We pulled together and had conversations to learn what folks wanted from Rhode Island. We had more than 350 unique attendees join our working group meetings in the summer of 2021. We also worked really hard to make sure that our kids were prioritized as essential stakeholders. We went into this knowing that PowerPoints are not what changes hearts and minds, that we needed to engage our kids and give them the tools to be able to express their desire to change the high school experience. So we had a statewide billboard challenge where students designed billboards, which we put up throughout the state to express their desire to change high school. We partnered with the Inside Out Project, which came to about 10 of our high schools statewide and also came to a handful of statewide events. And those, those are the pictures of the young people you see in the presentation where our young people uh, brought their faces to help change this work. We also, as we went through this, we knew that we needed to engage our teachers because our teachers know best how to support our kids. We, we knew uh, we had to be grounded in the recognition that there is no success in this work without the success of a teacher in a classroom. And we needed to help unlock the creative genius of our teachers instead of trying to homogenize education and what, what it looks like in the classroom. So what we heard from Rhode Islanders loud and clear uh, was that folks want our kids to graduate high school with open doors to be able to create their future. So what we did is we created three different priorities to be able to help change what high school looked like in Rhode Island. And in here, I won't go through all of these, is we gathered all the quotes that are handwritten in here are pieces of feedback that we received through this process from students, from parents, and from public comment uh, on the need to help change high school. So what we heard from our young people is in the education opportunity audit, the student surveys was 80% of our high school seniors said they wanted to go to college. When we actually sat down and looked at their transcript and look at the courses that they had enrolled in, it was only six in 10 kids statewide had actually taken the classes. And when we went deeper, it was only one in two kids statewide actually passed the classes to be eligible to go to our four-year colleges and our two-year community college without the need for remediation. So what we've done in Rhode Island is we've aligned our coursework requirements to be able to make sure it's the expectation for every single child statewide that they will graduate high school with an open door to be able to go to college. We also in Rhode Island have an amazing opportunity with the Rhode Island Promise Program is that every single one of our kids has the opportunity to graduate with a golden ticket to get either a free associate's degree and now two years of free tuition at Rhode Island College. So what we've done in Rhode Island is we've built uh, and we're building in uh, FAFSA into school accountability to be able to make sure our schools are supporting all of our kids and making sure they're completing the FAFSA and the state financial aid uh, forms for our un undocumented students. There's far too many students who were graduating high school, not receiving that information, and again, losing out on these amazing opportunities. We also knew we have a lot of kids who are not going to go to college after high school, and that's okay. But we wanted to make sure that our kids who are going to work after high school and our kids who go to college, many of them still have to work to support themselves before they, they earn that degree as we built in a graduation requirement that every single one of our kids will have to graduate high school with a resume. Priority two, and we heard a lot about this from our, your, our young people, is our kids are bored in school. They're not seeing relevance, meaning, and purpose in what high school looks like. And so we worked really hard to be able to build connections between real life, real world relevant learning experiences. In the education opportunity audit, our kids told us only half of them statewide felt like they had the ability to take classes they were passionate about in high school. And we surveyed them even deeper. They, only one in four kids believed all their courses were actually useful for what they wanted to do in their future. Why does this matter? Engage kids do better in school. Also engage kids are more likely uh, to, to succeed as they go forward. And so we worked really hard to make sure that the changes we made to high school are things that have real world relevant connections to our kids. And so we, what, what we've done in Rhode Island is we've adopted computer science as a statewide graduation requirement. We, we also have adopted financial literacy as a graduation requirement, the same for civics. And we've also renewed our commitment to the arts to be able to make sure all of our kids are getting access to a high quality art experience in high school. We also have worked hard to make sure that schools recognize and value work-based learning. We've seen a huge expansion in our schools of a kids participating in career and technical education programs. Again, our programs have grown in areas like engineering, computer science, where this is not the traditional Vogue tech programs of the past. These are really innovative, really exciting programs that prepare kids both to work and to succeed. We have built in a statewide uh, work-based learning requirement for all of our kids. And we wanna make sure that work-based learning is recognized just as much as classroom learning. Priority three, and this is an area that became a huge area of passion for us, 
is in many ways, high school has changed dramatically, but there have been few changes to how we're actually supporting our kids and our families statewide in Rhode Island. Um, the, the one quote that's always stayed with me here is just the burden to access resources is always on students and families. And our goal through this work was to change that. So right now in the country, and I think this is a really important set of statistics, our kids are actually taking some of the most rigorous coursework in the country. And there's actually a time use study uh, that's done uh, every couple of years through the Census Bureau that shows how people are spending their times. And our kids are actually spending more time on their schoolwork than they are um, sleeping, believe it or not. But as, as the coursework has become more challenging for our kids and more of our kids are going to college, which is unequivocally a great thing, we're starting to see a story of two different high school experiences for kids who have the ability to focus on their schoolwork and students who have adult responsibilities. Uh, we believe in Rhode Island that our kids should not have to choose between academics and economic security, but many of our young people are stepping up and helping lead their households in, in different ways. For many of our kids, um, youth earnings are actually lifting their families out of poverty. So uh, from the American Community Survey, it's actually 42% of households below the poverty line, the youth earnings of a young person lifts their family out of poverty. That's amazing, right? That's really exciting. Our young people have that character, they have that grit, they have that determination that we wanna see, but we're not recognizing it and valuing it in our schools. Also, uh, our, many of our young people are stepping up and taking care of family members. It could be a brother, sister, a sick parent or grandparent. But we surveyed all of our high school students statewide in Rhode Island in 2021. And it was actually 36% of our high school students statewide were taking care of somebody else uh, during the, the average school day. Um, and 7% were, were spending most of their day taking care of somebody else. Um, this is an actually really pretty incredible set of conversations. I first got introduced to the caregiving piece a couple of years ago when we did a, a shadow student day. I spent the day in Providence and there's a handful of students who were late um, and they came through, you know, during the middle of first period. And I asked them why they were late. And again, the, the kids were, you know, came in, were focused right away. Um, and we come to find out um, in, in Providence, like there is the case in many communities, the high school starts at about 7.30, 7.45. The elementary schools start at 8.45, 9 o'clock. And the buses tend to do the pickups about 8, 10, 8, 15. Um, the students who I, I spoke to at the school um, actually were seeing their younger brother and sister off because there has to be a, someone at the bus stop for the bus to pick up the student. Their mom worked and the student went to school uh, after their, their younger sister was picked up um, for the bus stop. So in our schools, we have our young people stepping up, helping support their families, again, showing that character I think we want our kids to see. But the schools are not recognizing the work that that student. And so in Rhode Island, we are building in that our, our kids, our caregiving youth, and our students who work to support their families will receive additional flexibilities. So instead of marking a kid tardy every day, who's being a responsible, great member of society, is we're gonna help make sure we can support that student academically and recognize and see the student's full experience. So what's next for us uh, in Rhode Island and with our work? Uh, we've created a plan to help support our schools and districts. These are a pretty broad and pretty dramatic set of changes in our schools. Um, and we heard from our school and district leaders, the state is usually really great at setting initiatives and bold goals, but what are you gonna do to help support us? So the work that we're doing now um, is we developed a five-year action plan to be able to help support our school and district leaders in implementing readiness-based graduation requirements. Um, and we focus on a handful of areas. First, we know we need to be good partners. We need to continue to listen. We need to support and hear the experiences of our school and district leaders. Just last night, we were sitting together with our special ed directors and with our school principals to be able to make sure we're helping design paths in our schools that are both supportive, inclusive of all of our students, especially our students with IEPs. Second, uh, we know that we need to reimagine learning. If we continue to teach Algebra 2 the way that we've always taught Algebra 2, uh, we are not going to get much further than where we are today. But there's a lot of work out there, um, and we've actually partnered with both the XQ Institute and the Carnegie Foundation to be able to help bring together educators to redesign what courses look like in and using high quality instructional materials. So it's not an or conversation, but how do we make courses more engaging for the kids in our classes while making sure we're still teaching to a high level? Third, and I think this is a piece we're really excited to tackle, um, is interwoven in all of these conversations is the need for comprehensive school counseling. One of the things I think we heard, which was rather concerning, 
is that there, the, the level of inconsistency from community to community and high school to high school in terms of school counseling is pretty dramatic. And then we've also, uh, as we've gone through these other areas, uh, built out just the, the direct action plan to make sure our kids are taking world language, that they're taking Algebra 2, and they're taking the courses they need to graduate eligible, and we're working on a daily basis with our schools. This whole plan, the work that we're doing, we've built, we've built it out to be shaped to support our schools and what they need to be successful. As we're going forward, we continue to meet with them on a regular basis. We continue to listen because we know that, again, if we want to be successful, there are going to be roadblocks. There are going to be challenges, but we need to be able to approach this together to be able to make sure all of our kids are graduating with that open door to be able to create their future. Thank you very much. Steve, on behalf of the Education Trust in Massachusetts and the Massing Polling Group, thank you so much for uh, sharing how Rhode Island has really made strides in connecting students to uh, career exploration, education opportunities, and college preparation programs. You shared a lot of information today, which I could tell by all of the reactions that you kept getting throughout your presentation really resonated with folks um, and really interesting ideas that I think we should be considering here in Massachusetts as we map a path forward. Um, Thank you once again. And um, I did see some questions regarding if you'll share some of the information um, that you shared today. We will be sending a post event email. So be on the lookout for um, Steve's presentation and other materials and information as well. Um, and now I'd like to welcome all speakers onto the screens for the audience Q and A. And I'm actually going to kick it off with a question for you, uh, Steve Osborne, just going to clarify since we have two Steves. Um, uh, so the question is, how are homework policy and assi assignments adjusted to accommodate the family life context for students who have responsibilities that are supporting their families? Yes, yeah, so, so we are working right now with our schools to develop what those policies look like. I, I think our, our goal is to help find different ways to use time during the school day to be able to make sure kids are able to succeed and thrive. And, and, and one of the statistics from the, the American Time Use Survey um, is that, so the average student uh, who does not work spends about eight hours a day on their schoolwork, so including their homework time, things like that. For our kids who are working, who are caregiving, um, they're only able to spend six hours of time um, each day on their schoolwork. And so our hope is how do we better use that time that's in the school day um, to be able to make sure our kids have time and space to be able to focus on their coursework are there things like summer school and different opportunities that we can leverage to be able to make sure our kids can apply themselves at the depth and level that they need to uh, to succeed and thrive in their coursework? Thank you, Steve. Uh, a question from the audience for you, Femi. Have states who have implemented FAFSA requirements shown an increase in college matriculation and persistence? So that is a great question and tricky, very tricky question to answer. And I will explain why it is tricky to answer. Uh, so these universal FAFSA policies were implemented in 2020. Uh, so peak COVID time and then subsequent policies that pass in different states also came out around 2021. So in addition to the fact that it was just not a good time in the world for any of us, it was also not a good time for analysts. So tracking students from 2020 to 2021, um, as far as like whether they stayed in school, whether they persisted has been a little bit difficult. Um, so it's hard to, to answer that question and the data now will start to look better and hopefully we can start to report some of that data that's coming out 2023 moving forward. However, I will say that there is longstanding existing data that suggests that students who complete the FAFSA by the end of high school are much more likely to pursue post-secondary education than their counterparts who do not. So those numbers are like 84% for students overall, but for students in the lowest economic quintile, so those the lowest fifth percent, the increase is 127%. So no questions asked that students are much more likely to pursue post-secondary education when they're equipped with that financial aid information that they get from the FAFSA. Thank you for adding that uh, context, Femi. Uh, Lizbeth, I have a question for you. Uh, how might the role of high school counselors be more, uh, be able to communicate more with parents and students prior to students transitioning to high school? Prior to transitioning to high school or to college? 
how might the role of high school counselors, so I think the essence of the, the question is if you can maybe reflecting on your experience or uh, maybe classmates or families members, uh, the role that uh, I know you mentioned early college, but the role that high school counselors can play um, in helping to raise awareness among students and families of some of the available opportunities. Yeah, so with raising awareness, um, my high school actually did something pretty cool, which um, really helped with parents' engagement, which was that they got on Facebook and Twitter, and they were able to communicate with parents like that. So a lot of Hispanic parents actually love Facebook, and that's one of the first things that they check in the morning because that's how they communicate with their families and stuff. Um, so getting on Facebook and making posts in English and Spanish really, really got the parents engaged, even for small stuff as like, hey, um, parent night is coming up, report card night is coming up, or applications are due next week. And something as simple as like the parent knowing applica college applications are due next week, they ask their kids like, hey, your applications are good. Like, even if they have nothing, if, even if they have it added to the application, even if they haven't checked the application, just asking their child like, hey, you did your application kind of adds that interaction back and forth that a lot of the time the, the child needs and the high school student needs. Something else that they did was that um, we had a newsletter that went home every single week um, in English and Spanish. And that's one of the most important things connecting to the parent in the way that they can connect back. Because if you just send a newsletter in English, it's just something the parent is going to look at and throw away or just put in the trash in their email. Saying, sending it in Spanish showcases that like, hey, you understand this is important. And a lot of parents read it because parents want to be engaged. They just don't feel like they can be. So um, those are a couple of things that really engaged parents um, when I was in high school. No, thank you. Really helpful. I think uh, that the key takeaway for me is that one size doesn't fit all. We need to make sure that there's different ways to be able to communicate uh, with parents and families and as well as uh, 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 being mindful uh, that not everyone speaks the same language. Uh, so I think at least uh, maybe the top five languages within the school district, making sure that that's accessible for families. Um, and also funny, uh, the little Facebook, uh, I definitely communicate with my Latina mom often on Facebook. So that, that is funny. Um, so I have a question that could either be for, um, Femi, uh, or Erica. Is there evidence elsewhere of what age introducing early college, AP, higher ed pathway mapping is most effective? How should we build a common and accessible virtual platform to help in parent engagement? I see so you, you look and I'll take myself off mute here. Um, you know, I think when it comes to the age of introducing some of these, these pathways, um, I wish the research were a little clearer, to be honest. I think what we see is that um, in a lot of our schools in Massachusetts, um, it is common to introduce early college sort of in a toe dip sort of way in ninth and 10th grade and then go really deep in 11th and 12th grade. And we see that that can be very effective. Um, we also know that in some of our schools, we're going right at it in ninth grade. Um, that's a lot of the schools that are doing more of a wall to wall model where every student in the school is taking part. Certainly we see that the impact can be really strong in both cases. And I think we need to have room for both models because it's not gonna be realistic that every school can go full wall to wall from nine through 12. So I guess what I would say is the more the better, the earlier the better, and um, there's room and necessity for uh, different models to be here as well. Thank you, uh, Femi. Yeah, I will chime in really quickly and just agree with Erica. I wish that there were data that just was like, hey, this is the right way to do this. Unfortunately, like districts and, and different places are kind of left to try to figure this out on their own. But I do think it is really important to start having those conversations about career pathways early, perhaps earlier than high school. And I do think that they should not be limited to just college. So again, talking about those other post-secondary options that we discussed uh, early in the conversation, I think it's really critical for students to start thinking about the role that they see themselves in in the future and start to be able to align things with their skills and align things with their interests. And I don't think there's any harm in, in doing that pre-high school. Thank you both for sharing. I have a question now for Steve Kay. With regards to par parental knowledge of admissions process, did the analysis account for social capital and, and its role in distribution of information to families and students? 
That's a really good question. And I think we see the evidence of the importance of social capital just in how the how the uh, charts actually look. You know, we did, it wasn't included in the survey explicitly, but you can see, I think, the impact of, um, of you know, just uh, of social capital when you look at the at how responses are distributed and you look at, you know, uh, parents who think that they know a lot about the process and parents who think they don't know a lot about the process and who's been exposed to it and who hasn't been exposed to it. So I think you, you certainly see the impact of that and it, it, uh, um, its importance or, or the, the hurdle that it presents and the importance of surmounting that hurdle for policymakers. Um, so not in the survey specifically, but definitely highlighted by the survey results. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, now another question for Steve O. What were some of the key strategies in Rhode Island used to get investments across your state in changing requirements for college and career preparation curriculum and in investing for more funding? Yep. Yeah. So we we have, uh, I think, worked really hard to build a compelling case. Um, one, to both show that our kids are ready and prepared to do it, and then also to be able to show the demand for it. Um, and, and, and to be able to pull on the set of partners, both from the, the higher education side and employer side to say that things are working. Um, and so that's helped us get investments where, again, we're one of only a handful of states where our kids in high school can take unlimited dual enrollment classes um, at no cost to the student, their family, or their school district. Um, and then through the work we're doing in the CTE space, um, it's actually been great. We're uh, through the, by adopting an employer-led demand-driven approach to CTE. Um, our employers are the ones coming to the state house and speaking out on the benefits and the impact of our program. So it's it's helped us be able to get funding to to invest in our schools to be able to make sure our our, um, our programs are supported, and also be able to help invest in creating new programs, which helped launch a lot of this work. Thank you, Steve. And I think we have time for one more question, uh, Lizbeth. This one's for you. How did your early college experience help prepare you for college? Did you find out about early college opportunities through your high school counselor or just if you can share um, a little bit of insight? Yeah, so my early college experience for sure shaped um, my ability to go to college. It's much, it's very different, like thinking about college and being like, yeah, I'm gonna go to college versus actually step stepping into a campus and imagining yourself on that campus. Like being able to walk on the campus and also have support. So like if you don't do something right or if you aren't feeling too confident, like being able to go to your early college counselor and be like, hey, how do I do this? Um, How do I navigate this? That really helped me close the gap between like um the students who are in college with me now that have parents that went to college versus myself who didn't have parents who went to college um be really like just being able to sit in that classroom and tell myself oh I can do it like I'm here now I can definitely do this in two years is really really raised my confidence and really changed the way that I viewed college instead of viewing it as like this like unattainable thing it was like no I got this like look at me now I could do this later. Um, and the way I found out about early college is that my school kind of told me since the beginning of it, it's like freshman year, it's like, hey, early college, junior year, um, it, we, it's a known thing that like sophomore year is like the hardest year for us because um, early college is junior year. So it was pretty like our counselors told us, but it was pretty known that it's like early college, we're doing that junior year. Um, so kind of dipping our toes again um, into dipping our toes freshman and sophomore year of just like knowing about it and then going full force junior and senior year. All right, looking at the time, we might have time for one more question. Let me look. Um, so this is maybe more towards uh, Erica or Femi, of course, of the floor is um, open. Um, you shared about, uh, we've heard from uh, many of you, uh, what state leaders can do to address some of the um, access gap and, and, um, the, and um, that we've heard from today. So you're just curious, what's something your organization um, is, uh, is doing that you haven't shared yet um, or would like to do in the coming years to, to help implement some change and address some of the issues that were uh, raised today? Sure, I think, oh, sorry, we did it again, Erica. 
Uh, I, I cannot put the pressure on you again. I will go first. Uh, so some things uh, that you aspire is doing that I think are worth mentioning is broadening the way we think about and talk about post-secondary access because for a long time, our focus was solely college. And while it is still a primary focus, we are starting to have conversations about that narrative and how we, every student doesn't need to be funneled into college and that isn't the only pathway. And so I think that as an organization, we can and plan to continue to think about other ways that we can still support our target group of students. So again, low income first gen students of color and getting to where it is that they want to be, whether that is college or a trade or an apprenticeship. And I think that um, it's a great and positive shift that we are starting to make as of late. Thank you, Femi. Uh, you know, on the Alliance side, we exist as an organization to support this work and to see high quality early college uh, really thrive in the Commonwealth. Uh, we do this, we're both a policy and a practice organization. And what I mean by that is um, our, our practice work is we get down on the ground and we get our hands dirty and work with programs who are implementing uh, early college to really learn about what the experience is on the ground. We think it makes us better advocates and the policy side of our work. Um, so we're continuing to deepen both our practice work and our policy work, um, going to bat for what we know are um, incredible leaders and students and families on the ground need to really make this, you know, thrive. Well, thank you all. That is all the time that we have today. Uh, I can't thank you enough for taking time um, out of your, I'm sure, very busy schedules to join us this morning to share a little bit about what you're doing, whether that be in your state or whether that uh, whether that be uh, next door in Rhode Island uh, or, or here in Massachusetts to really help uh, level the playing field for all students. Uh, keep an eye out for future events like this. Uh, our partner at the Massing Polling Group um, continues uh, to put out meaningful polls on a number of different topics, including we will be coming together again to release uh, another parent education poll in the spring of 2024. Uh, also, as a reminder, if you missed any of today's um, event, there will be a recording. And as I mentioned earlier, we will also be sending a post event email. So be on the lookout at Mass Inc polling.com or the Education Trust in Massachusetts. Uh, thanks again to the Bar Foundation for sponsoring the poll and to the audience. Thank you for joining us today and for such uh, great questions. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you again.